Hello, 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 everybody. I am so excited. Uh, my name is Ramonda Young, and I am one third of Mahogany Books. My husband, Derek, is part of it, and our daughter, Mahogany, is the other third. So it's definitely a family business. And uh, we're just excited to have this conversation with this amazing sister right here, Miss Alex L, Alexandra L. How are you? <laughs> Alex is fine, and I am good. I'm really happy to be here and be in conversation with you. I'm so excited. Thank you for extending this space to me. Absolutely, absolutely. We're excited to have you. But I will. I want to share with um, people here tonight who may not be familiar with Mahogany Books. We are in Washington D.C. and have been in business now. Wow, thirteen years. Wow. Um, and yeah, 13 years, 18 years married. So we, this is all we, you know, our business has been a huge part of our marriage. Um, but we specialize in books that are written for, by, and about people of the African diaspora. And so really black books, we actually coined the hashtag black books matter. Um, and it's something that is so important to us to make black books accessible, no matter where you live. Um, and I'm from Oklahoma. So Alex, if you hear me say some crunchy things, that country comes out often. <laughs> Very proud of who I am and where I've come from. Um, but yeah, we're excited to have Mahogany Books in DC and Anacostia, and we ship mm -hmm. books all over the United States. So we've got a great uh, community of followers all over who are really just, just humbling and amazing to us that they choose to shop with us. So that's Mahogany Books. We're online, we're in DC as well. And so it is our goal to have these conversations, especially during this time. I think they've been really um, important during this space that a lot of people are at home or may not be working. And so I'm excited to, to, to have this conversation tonight. A couple of quick little housekeeping things. One, we cannot hear or see all of your beautiful faces, but that allows you to have food. If you're eating food and eating dinner, enjoy your dinner. If you're drinking a little wine, enjoy your whatever, enjoy your beverage. If you're in your pajamas, we can not see that. So get nice and cozy and comfortable. But this also allows you to ask questions. So if you look at the bottom of the screen and the chat box that says, say something nice, there's a little plus there. So if you have a question that you'd like to ask Alex, um, uh, just press on the plus sign and it'll allow you to post a question. You can post it there and then over to the left at the bottom, there's a spot that says ask a question. So you can also click there. So throughout this conversation, feel free to, to post your question there. And then halfway through here around 730 or so, I'll start pulling questions from the audience. Um, so yes, post your question uh, where it says ask a question or just press the plus sign there. Um, I would also encourage everybody tonight to use hashtag after the rain. Do you have a special yeah. hashtag that you're using, Alex? I don't, but okay. feel free to do that. But that's <laughs> wonderful. And um, on Instagram, the book does have an Instagram page. It's at after the rain book. So feel free to tag me at underscore Alex L and the book and I will see it and love it. And yes, that's fine. There you go. Yeah, she got the book has its own page. I saw that. I was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> its own community. <laughs> yeah. So, so thank you all for coming, and again, it's an honor to have you here um, to join us in this conversation. And I'm looking forward to getting started. So, Alex, out here in the DC area with us, tell us yeah. a little bit for some of them, uh, um, our guests who are not familiar with you. Tell us a little yeah. bit about you. So, my name is Alex. I am an author and self-care facilitator. Um, I teach writing workshops and retreats all across everywhere. And my goal and mission with my work outside of, of course, writing books for you, for us, is to bring people closer to their own voice and their own stories through writing practice and storytelling. So in a nutshell, that is me. I'm also a mother of three and a wife. And um, yeah, that is who I am in a, in a ball, in a condensed ball. That is who I am. <laughs> that is enough. Three kids. How has motherhood been? <laughs> oh man, it's before. been very unique. And uh, during the pandemic, you know, I, as we were mentioning in the green room, you know, just trying to do our best with what we have. And I feel really grateful that I am home with the babies and my husband. Um, and it's been a journey, but you know, we have each other. And I think that that really is what keeps me centered in this, even with the busyness and the toddlers and the Zoom school, it's just like, we're in this together, so 
Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's definitely been a big adjustment for us too. We have a daughter, like I mentioned earlier, mahogany. And so her room is next to my office here. So she's playing her violin throughout the day. I'm trying to turn down my Zoom and, you know, but allow her the space of, you know, do her thing. So it's definitely interesting. But like you said, I wouldn't change it. I, it's a blessing to be able to have the opportunity to be home and not be running around. In the past, I've been running around, running to the store, running to do this. And so I'm yeah. grateful for this space and this time. Yeah. Mm, I feel you. You, you feel me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I was going to ask you as well, during this, this pandemic, how have you handled it? We'll talk about the book too, but I want to know how there's a lot of people here who may be at home by themselves, single, you know, you have kids, I have a daughter, but a lot of people may not be in that space. Right. So mm -hmm. how have you been handling being at home? I know it's, it's, it's um, maybe a joyful time at, at times for you, but what advice would you give some of those who are not in that space, who are at home by themselves and how have you handled it mentally? Mm, um, what I would say to that is pencil yourself in. I think now more than ever, I need to be doing that. And I've been trying my best to do that, um, especially because I thrive off of the quiet. That's when I get my best work done. That's when I'm able to really focus mm -hmm. and to be able to say to my husband, hey, I need X amount of time to get this done. I need to get up earlier, whatever, just to be on the same wave mm -hmm. of tag team um, so that whoever is working because he is a screenwriter. So he works from home too. So whoever is working is like with the kids. So kind of having a schedule for my single folks who are, who are not with kids or who are not, um, you know, partnered, making sure that you get outside, making sure that you phone a friend and also getting into a routine. Mm -hmm. Like that's something that I need to, even as a married person who's raising kids is I need a routine. If I don't have my routine, I, I literally could stay in my pajamas all day. And we all know that while as comfortable as that is after a few days, you know, we can start to really feel that in our body, you know, not getting up and moving around as much, not getting that fresh air and that vitamin D. So just be in tune with your body and what you need. And I know that being alone can be really isolating. So make sure that you have your support system, your pod of people, your FaceTime group, you know, that you're connecting with so that you don't get too you know, down. I mean, it gets dark at four o'clock here in the DC area now, like four or 4.30, you know, the seasonal depression is real. So just make sure that you're leaning into your community and to yourself as well. Have you heard, and you with your almost 1 million followers, hello, somebody. Wow, that's huge <laughs> on Instagram. <laughs> but um, have you seen an, an uptick in people who, you know, may reach out to you and who are in this space, you know, maybe by themselves who are dealing with some things mentally, emotionally, do you get, has that been on a rise for you in this, in this time? Or is it kind of even cute? It's definitely been on a rise. I've been teaching virtually this year. Um, I've taught four uh, different four week writing courses and I've reached about 5,000 people through those courses. And that has been the most beautiful experience mm -hmm. of this pandemic is that not only are we going through this collective grief together, but we're also showing up to heal collectively as well. Mm -hmm. and that's one of the biggest things that I've been hearing from folks. It's like, thank you for making this space for me to not only lean into my own writing practice, but to cultivate community with people I otherwise would not be in community with. So mm -hmm. that's been really major as well. And people are just like, we're all going through the same thing together in some mm -hmm. way, shape or form. And that's kind of the common denominator here that I think people are finding comfort in. Yeah. Yeah. It's so true. We, one of the important things for us when we created our bookstore um, was to create community and create a space where people can come in and talk about being proud, being black, being, you know, whether it's politics, but just being in a space where they felt at home and yeah. for us being closed, we were closed from March all the way to October. And so we saw people reaching out saying, you know, when are you guys going to open up again? Are you going to have events? Because there was this longing to feel connected to each other and just have and foster communication. So that's, you know, we started doing these events and, and people were, you know, just really excited about it. So I'm, I'm listening to you saying that and have seen that that need or that want from people to that to be in you know community with others and yeah i feel isolated you know it's, it can be crazy i hear so much going on this year it was hectic still you know we're still in the midst of that so yeah yeah no totally totally yeah so with this new baby you have birthed <laughs> you have birthed this is book number 
Yes. Number four, yeah. book number four. Yes, yes. You, you birthed this. How do you feel about it? Are you excited? <laughs> oh yeah, this is by far my favorite. Um, this is my big girl book is what me and my editor and agent have been calling it. Mm -hmm. um, I turned in my, I mean, this book was in the has been in the making for about two and a half years, and I turned in my manuscript when I was eight and a half months pregnant with mm -hmm. my youngest, mm -hmm. and just to see it in the world and to have the, these stories and lessons encapsulated in here. I don't think a lot of people were looking, were knew what they were in store for with this mm -hmm. book. You know, a lot of people may know me for my affirmations or my poetry, but I stepped outside of that because long form writing is really my heart's work. Mm -hmm. And um, to put this in like a mini memoir form for people to lean on um, has been so, it's been amazing. It has just been wonderful. So I hope this book continues to touch hearts and lives and community all over. Mm -hmm. And so you wrote this book. You could have chosen any book to write. You could have said, no, I'm going to do a poetry book again. I'm not going to put myself this deep, this vulnerable on these pages. Why did you say this was the time to do that? Why now? Mm, so it's interesting. I In my poetry, I showed up vulnerable in different ways, mm -hmm. right? Um, you can kind of be abstract about how you're showing up. Um, but I knew that I wanted this book whatever the next book was, which ended up being this, mm -hmm. I wanted it to be um, a collection of hope and healing and compassion. And I told myself that I would not write this book if I was not in the place to greet the lessons that I've learned with a sense of grace and understanding and compassion. And I talk about some really personal stuff in here. I talk about my relationship with my mother, which mm -hmm. is was is mending, but also very tender to recall some of these things and um, to have her reading it and things like that. Like, how do I hold space, not only for just my stories, but for other people's stories? And I wanted to make sure I did that with, with love at the center, mm -hmm. even if the story was challenging or um, a pain point. So I think I did that well. And I'm really, I'm really honored that I have people who not only trust that I'll take care of their stories on mm -hmm. the page, but also um, that I have people in my life and in my corner who encourage me to share those vulnerable bits so that other people can in turn stand in their power and lean into their vulnerability. Absolutely. What would you say um, has been one of the biggest challenges you've had to overcome? I know you mentioned the relationship with your mom, but when you look back, Mm. Wow, Alex, you have really done this thing, girl, and you've done it well. What was that challenge that made you step back and, and have that type of response to that reaction in your, on your journey so far? Mm. I think I talked about that a little bit in, in my turning point in the essay validation. Mm -hmm. um, and I really had a big turning point when I was around 23. I'm 31 now, just to give some context. And um, I knew that I had to stop making the same decisions and choices and thinking I was going to get these different results because that is absolutely not how life works. Um, so I had to not only choose myself and choose my healing, but also I had to own up to my shortcomings and to my faults and to the role that I was playing in some mm -hmm. of my suffering and my missteps. Um, I think a lot of times we look outside of ourselves, even when we are in the wrong for maybe something to blame. You know, I used my childhood and my and feeling like I was neglected and um, the abuse that I went through, you know, as my permission slip to misbehave or to mm -hmm. not show up in the world in a way that was reflective of the person I knew that I wanted to be, right? So I had to really make these hard choices of stepping out of victim role and using that as a as a excuse to not be my best and to step into resilience and mm -hmm. to trust that no matter what I've went through, no matter what I've walked through, I am still standing. And with that still standingness, I can continue to change. Mm -hmm. And I think once we self choose in that way, the game just shifts for the better. 
Yeah. Do you find it hard to self choose or have you in the past? Do you still struggle with that at now or no? You're like, I got it now. I've been there. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think it's, I think it's, um, it's much more second nature now mm -hmm. to say, to choose myself. And then when I'm thinking about not choosing myself, I have the, the language and the tools in my emotional toolbox to be like, okay, so why are you shrinking right now? Mm -hmm. What is this coming from? Why are you feeling this way? Um, so I have like that inner dialogue ability now because of all the stuff that I did go through and all the stuff that I grew through, right? It's like, I would much rather be true to myself than to shrink to fit into boxes that aren't mine right so mm -hmm. um yeah it's not hard for me anymore okay alex but that's because i know a lot of you know a lot of women i do at times struggle with choosing me at moments and it's not because of somebody else it's really more self-imposed you know mm -hmm. to be the perfect one oh i'll say yes to everything and i'm like worn out at moments and so um, yeah. very, I have to be very intentional for me to keep choosing me. If not, I'll just go with the flow and just say yes to everybody at yeah. moments. And so, yeah. yeah. So yeah. I'm just wondering if a lot of women and men who are here too um, in the room may deal with that, um, choosing ourselves first. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, it's not easy. I'm not going to say that this was a journey that I was just like, here I am and I'm self choosing. You know what I mean? It's, it's, a, it's absolutely a daily practice. So is it harder some days than others? Absolutely. But do I have the tools to choose myself also? Absolutely. So it's like just having that, that inner dialogue, you know, that self reflection time, that self awareness. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So do you, um, I was going to say, how do you, we have daughters, three, three girls, Ooh, yeah. girl, three girls. <laughs> yeah. My poor husband. <laughs> I love it. How, how do you instill this at a, you know, you have a one, I think one, one and a half year old. Um, and all the way up to a 12, right? Yeah. So we have a one year old, a two and a half and a newly 13. She turned 13 four days ago. Oh, very, very. How do you instill this type of self love? Um, into them. And I know my daughter's 15, as I mentioned, and I know one of the big lessons that I want for her is to have this type of self-confidence. I don't want her to succumb to peer pressure. I just want her to be this strong, you know, woman and and not and just listen to her own voice. Yes, mm -hmm. you can hear people, but really honor that voice. How do you teach that or what are you doing to teach that to them at this age that they are? Well, with the babies, it's more so just um, allowing them to take up space. Mm the best way that they can as toddlers, more so for my two and a half year old, because she's very, very strong willed. She's spirited. Okay. Um, so just like allowing her to have her moments and to take up space and not um, being overly critical about certain things that a toddler does, mm -hmm. right? Um, but with our oldest, she is such an awesome kid um, and she's really self-confident. She's an artist. And I think that that has a big, that plays a big role in her confidence is her, um, her craft that she's honed in on and how we, I, I have done so many different exercises with her. You know, she was the only child for a long time. Um, so we've done the sticky note exercises. We talk really openly. I have a journal that I write to her. Um, and we just have open dialogue and conversations um, that I didn't have necessarily mm -hmm. as a kid, you know? Yeah. So just, you know, allowing space again for my kids to be who they are, not who I want them to be. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of parents struggle with that ebb and flow of individuality and also having this human that you literally created you know what i mean and like mm -hmm. uh, but allowing them their freedom um mm -hmm. and allowing them their voice i didn't have a voice growing up um and i just am doing things really differently from how i was parented and with that um i am forever not only mothering them but mothering myself which mm -hmm. is like really big especially as a black woman um so yeah that's huge i'm just thinking of my daughter, um, I forgot who told me one time. I, I found my my daughter's. She's brilliant. She inspires me. She's only fifteen. Just just amazing young person. 
Mm. But I found myself, she's very, I'm an extrovert all day. You know, my husband's an introvert, so we balance each other out in this beautiful way. And so she's an introvert. But I found myself when we would go places apologizing for her, like, oh, she's just kind of shy. Or, oh. And a friend of mine, she, 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 she told me, she said, don't apologize for your daughter. You don't have to apologize for her. She could show up just as full as she is and as powerful as she mm. is. Even in her space as being an introvert, you know, mm-hmm. something that's a dirty word. It is not. All of us have strengths in our own way. Mm-hmm. But it stuck with me to not apologize for her. Because I always, mm-hmm. felt, you know, especially my extrovert type of energy. Oh, 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 she's just quiet. She's okay. She likes you or whatever. Mm-hmm. No, I don't. She's fine just the way she is. So like you're saying, allow her to take up her own space mm-hmm. in her own way. Um it was a huge shift for me mentally to let that go a few years ago. But yeah, yeah. it's I a great that. lesson. That's a great lesson. Yeah, I don't have to apologize. I love that you're allowing yours, you know, to take up their own space and be toddlers, be who they are. I think too, as black women, we come from, I won't say, I don't want to generalize, but family is decorum and image and all this is important. So you better, better look good. You better smell good. Your hair has to be a certain way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that comes with a lot of extra, you know, craziness at times. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think- and I think, I think with you saying that, what came mm-hmm. up for me is like, um, how I just want my kids to feel like they're kids. Mm-hmm. And I remember my mom saying, um, it's really nice to see you letting your kids be kids. Um, especially because of the dynamic that she and I had. Yeah. So as we relate to one another now as not just mother and daughter, but woman to woman, um, it's really awesome to see that folks understand that kids should be allowed to be kids mm-hmm. and little black kids in particular, you know, really deserve their childhood and their innocence and their joy and their fun. Um, so I just try to keep that yeah. at the center. Yeah. Well, they are your- from me, but they are not, you know, they are not mine. They are from me, but they are not mine. And that's something that I really lean on. Absolutely. What would you say was your biggest aha moment with your mom? I know you referenced her quite a bit in that relationship in this book. And mm-hmm. even now, when you look back over that journey, and I know it's still, you know, what was your biggest aha moment that you walk away with, with mm-hmm. that experience with her, that relationship? Yeah, so I think my favorite essay in here that mm-hmm. talks about me and my mom's story is comparison. Yeah. And comparison was about how jealous I got after being on a friend's farm with her and her mother and just seeing their beautiful, whimsical, almost unrealistic dynamic or from the lens of me, it seemed perfect, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then I had this moment with my friend and she shared with me, I don't want to give it all away if you haven't read the book, but she shared, (laughs) she shared with me how her and her mom also have had their struggles and had their time. And um, that just gave me a a different perspective. And this has happened, you know, years ago now, but I remember, you know, driving home from that experience and like trying to just recall moments of gratitude and recall moments of grace that I could extend to my mom, even though she is who she is, right? It doesn't mean that she doesn't deserve grace and she doesn't deserve understanding and appreciation for the for who she is and who what she has done and how she does show up. So mm-hmm. I wrapped up the end of that. Um, essay with with my mom's love language of being someone who is always asking if like you need something done you know and or she'll just do it so she was taking care of our middle child and I came home and she had all the baby's clothes folded and without me asking or anything just just showing up in that way and that was kind of my aha moment of like this woman is a woman Mm -hmm. this she's not just my mother and she does things like this to show up. And that is just as um, deserving of praise and celebration. And also just, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Not, not acceptance, but just, um, hmm. I, I'm, I'm missing it right now, but hmm. perhaps acceptance and perhaps like this awareness of people are who they are. We can either accept them or we don't have to. Right. And 
I am choosing to move through my relationships with acceptance at the core, even if it's been a challenge in the past. Mm-hmm. How did you get there? Like, you know, a lot of people may see Alex L., this woman who's got all these followers and, you know, just I think a lot of times we get with social media, people will have these certain images. Do you feel like a certain pressure comes on you that you have to to have this type of standard or when you meet people, when you see people, do you, do you carry that or have you ever carried that? I haven't. Um, I, and I, it's interesting I because it. I say all the time, Instagram isn't real, mm-hmm. you know, like they could decide to sell the company and boop, everything will change. Or they can decide to be like, okay, the world's had enough of Instagram and delete it. And then where is your brand? Yeah. Where is your heart's work? Right. So Instagram is, is definitely an awesome community that I've cultivated. Um, mm-hmm. But it is not um, life. Yeah. And I think a lot of people um, don't realize that because we're in the, we live in this society where social media rules the world. Yeah. Um, what I do like to be in conversation about on that platform and through the, the snippets of work that I share on there is that we are all in this together. We yeah. are never alone in our struggles. And if I can't, help you with something or this quote doesn't help you with something or that book doesn't help you with something, somebody in the comments you can connect with and there's your community, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Another thing that I like to make sure that I'm displaying is that we are our own inner experts. Mm -hmm. So many people look at folks with large followings or celebrities or, Mm -hmm. you know, politicians and things like that and think that they have the answers when really our answers lie within us. So when we are self-aware enough and ready enough to have that inner dialogue conversation, again, the game will change, you know? Um, So my biggest joy in this work and as an author and as a facilitator of self-care practice and writing practice Mm -hmm. is to make sure that people know that they are their own leader and they are their own um, true, truest friend, truest teacher. And I think that more people need to be giving folks permission to like lean into that instead of looking for other people to have the mm-hmm. answers. Cause I don't know, I'm still figuring it out. I'm a student of life. So if you ask me today, it might be different, you know, tomorrow, yeah. but as of today and the days, you know, at, before this, I have always been a student of life and that mm-hmm. is how I, I live. Yeah. What would you say, for women who are trying to cultivate their tribe offline, right? Because there's, mm-hmm. there. there's a whole other world offline. You know, how do you cultivate that? And what kind of tips would you give other women who are here? How do they build those relationships? Because I've, I've heard some women say, I don't have any friends with girl women or, you know, I don't do that. Or, you know, just that that space there. But how do you cultivate that tribe? And, and, and what would you, mm-hmm. what tips would you give other women to do that? Sisterhood is so sacred to me and I'm the only child. So that's probably why I have all these kids and it might have even more kids because Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that is just so important to me. Um, And being in community with women, I just spoke with my friend uh, Rachel Cargill yesterday for my podcast. And we talked about this very thing, like how it's just different when you are in relationships and friendships with women. That is such sacred territory. Um, And I don't know how to, it's so interesting. I haven't had to make new friends really as a grown person, Mm -hmm. but my most recent friendships are now, you know, going on, I would say four years old. And I just connected with women and their stories or they connected with mine and I allowed the space to get to know uh them and i think that when we open ourselves up to that i mean that's vulnerable too you know especially as an adult making friends it's it's very vulnerable (laughs) i'm not gonna say that's easy but i remember like really praying for um other married women and other mother friends because i was really the only friend in my circle who was partnered or was had or who's always had a kid i had my first daughter i was young i was 18 so i've always been a mother Mm -hmm. um so it's you know been interesting and i remember praying like please lord send me some married friends send me some mama friends and 
too popped up four years ago and mm -hmm. we have been in connection ever since and sisterhood ever since and mm -hmm. it's i cannot explain the importance that is for me especially as an only child mm -hmm. it's like i still have only child syndrome it's like i I want I want siblings, you know. <laughs> and, yeah. Like my husband comes from a big family, so I have his siblings, but it's just different. It it just hits different when you are in space with um like minded, mm -hmm. um, well meaning, kind women. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not the only child, but I have two other sisters, and so I I crave sisterhood from that side. You know, I'm very close. I'm FaceTiming my sisters all the time. Mm -hmm. or, you know, I bought something from my house. I'm having them on FaceTime trying to get their opinion. So that, yes. you know, cultivating those relationships, you know, as women is is huge. And so it is. Yeah, I just it wanna, is. Yeah. I want to encourage other women to continue to do that and, and to know it can be safe when it's with the right people. I think that's the other piece, too. Everybody done yeah. in my book, all of you, you know, they some of those spaces are sacred. So but. I think we allow ourselves, you know, to be vulnerable, as you mentioned, I think it allows those relationships to flourish. So. And something else I would say is like, be around, go to places, even if it's by yourself, where you think you might connect with like-minded people. And that's one thing I really miss um, is teaching in person and going on retreats and being in all day workshops with my community. I miss that so much. And so many friendships have bloomed mm. um, through that connection. I have folks who have been in, who've come to every workshop and they will meet up with the first group of women that they met and have lunch before and catch up. And I just think that that is what life is meant to do is like to cultivate that connection and that like-mindedness. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So there's a couple things I want to address in the book, and I do want to let people know if you have questions, I see a little orange button down there now. Click, you can add, click that and ask your question there, and I'll um, pull them up here shortly and ask Alex, Alex, any questions that you have. So definitely post it there. Um, but there's um, some. I, I did not want to dog ear this book, but I have. You know, so you many people have said I, it's too pretty. I don't want to dog ear it. Dog ear it. Do it. Oh, good. So good. <laughs> it's just a good quality, quality book. But um, you were touching on a comparison earlier, and this is um, one of the the comparison meditation that I love. It says, "Think of a recent comparison you've made in your life. Take another look and consider how comparing can teach you what you have, not what you're lacking." Mm -hmm. How did that show for you? And I know you talked about it, looking, you know, at your your friend and your mom's relationship and all that, but share a little bit more about what that comparison means. And I, and I also say from when I look at where we are, we talked about social media a lot of times, so many mm. women comparing themselves to what they see or what they see somebody post or a happy smile or relationship. It's a lot of comparison and it's leaving us in this a weird space, I believe. But for you, what would you, what would you say about that? Sharing that. Oh my goodness. I'm pulling up the meditation now just so I can have it in front of me. Yeah. Um, so I think that really did just come from my relationship with my mom and mm -hmm. I hadn't felt that envious of someone as an adult mm -hmm. before. Mm -hmm. And it was like intense. I could feel the sweat dripping off my body. I was just like, and I was upset. I'm like, this is so unfair that mm -hmm. I have that relationship with my mom and this woman and her mom are just like the happiest bunch. I mean, it was idyllic, like how mm -hmm. they were. And maybe it was because I was coming over and they had everything, mm -hmm. you know, out and together and beautiful. But I immediately, I was just drawn to their connection. And I also remember, you know, my mother-in-law who passed away four years ago being this rock for me and my husband and talking to Ryan, my husband about like how hard it was for me to receive that love. And I just mm -hmm. remember feeling um, like cursed that I didn't have that relationship. And then not allowing other people to love me because I was so nervous that mm -hmm. they would take their love away, right? So it was just all this really big emotional stuff coming to the center. And I had to remind myself that I can't compare. I saw this quote today on Instagram mm -hmm. and it said, don't compare someone's, uh, no, 
don't, don't compare someone's five minutes to someone else's five years or something mm-hmm. like that. Right? I don't remember mm-hmm. it all the way, but I was like, that's it. You're right, right. That's it. Like you don't know. And that's really in a nutshell, especially on social media. You don't know what other people are moving through and going through. And even in personal relationships, like I'm, I created this whole story in my head about this mm-hmm. mom and daughter's perfect relationship, not knowing much about them and not knowing anything about their dynamic, right? Mm -hmm. So then having this really eye-opening conversation with that friend um, and her saying, yeah, like we've had our stuff too and this is hard too. It's just like, you never know what other people Mm -hmm. are walking through. So to just be mindful and to be careful when we are doing that, creating that story of comparison Mm -hmm. in our heads. Yeah. What do you want people to walk away with once they read after the rain what do you want them to 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 walk away with with this Mm. (laughs) i want them i want people to walk away with curiosity um, about their own truth and that's why after each lesson there's an affirmation Mm -hmm. and there's a meditation and that is that is the call to action for the reader to break up those longer pieces and to give them a moment of pause and reflection. Mm -hmm. As a writer, it is important to me that I um, recruit everyone in their mama to be a writer as well. Even if they think (laughs) they aren't, Mm -hmm. I hear hear that a lot. I'm not a writer, but you totally are. We all are. You don't have to share it on social media or write books, Mm -hmm. but you are a writer. And to get closer to yourself and to your voice, doing that on the page is so central mm-hmm. to clarity. And I want people to do that. Um, so you want a lot of writers to come out after, after this book, <laughs> uh, after they read it. Why did you call it After the Rain? Can you share that with everybody too? Oh, that's so <laughs> funny. I named this project before I wrote it. So this is like a four-year-old title. Mm-hmm. And it's so interesting. My publisher was like, this title is so timely for 2020. And I'm just like, huh divine alignment because they absolutely wanted me to change the name at first it wasn't going to be after the rain they were going back and forth and they finally were like you know what we think it's after the rain i'm like yes it right. is right. <laughs> so that was also we we joke about that um me and my editor mm-hmm. because it's just hilarious how things that are supposed to be will be um mm-hmm. but this title i just i picked it because there have been so many rainstorms in my life and so many um, downpours, right? But I've always been able to climb out of it, whether it is through therapy, whether it is through my writing practice, um, dancing, um, hope, prayer, meditation. I've always found a way to find out what is on the other side of the rain, even if Mm -hmm. in the moment I was not prepared to crawl out of those stormy seasons, right? And I want this book to serve as a reminder that life isn't supposed to be dry. You know, life isn't supposed to be without um, without storms mm-hmm. and rainy seasons. It is what we do after the rain that really sets the tone for what we learned in the rain. And that is really how this came to be. That's why they're called lessons. The chapters are called lessons because it's really what I learned after some of those really tender and challenging moments Mm -hmm. in my life. I love it. I love it, Alex. I'm so excited for you. I'm so excited for (laughs) the book to be out. I'm so glad people can engage with you and and interact and hear your words of affirmation, whether it's on social media, whether it's in your book. Um, I think it's Girl, you're going to leave here one day. And the legacy that mm. you want to be behind is so immense and so intense. And so I just want to say thank you for that, for stepping out and being bold and being um, courageous enough to stand up and just be you and be authentic. That's what I think a lot of people gravitate towards um, thank you. when they see you and, and experience you. So kudos to you. Thank you. I received that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> ask some of these questions here. I have some more of my own, but I want to make sure I get theirs in. Yes. Yes, for sure. Um, let me see. Um, one of the questions says, um, I loved how you talked about being vulnerable. And I noticed during, oh, it just moved. I noticed during quarantine that I find it difficult being vulnerable with others. Mm-hmm. It took some time to notice that I found it difficult being vulnerable with myself mm-hmm. and being open to loving myself fully. 
Was it hard being vulnerable with yourself and truly looking back on your life and the different paths you took that you took? How did it feel? Mm. Oh my gosh, vulnerability is still terribly hard for me. Mm -hmm. um, as Miss Brene Brown says, vulnerability hangover. Like truly, um, I am somebody who thinks something I'm unlearning that I can literally do everything on my own. Mm -hmm. And that, excuse me, comes from taking care of the house to taking care of myself when really I need to be in partnership and in spaces where I don't have to carry the world on my shoulders mm -hmm. and being vulnerable enough to ask for help and to name what I need is hard. Mm -hmm. um, have I gotten better? Yes. Is it still challenging? Yes. And when it comes to vulnerability of storytelling on the page, especially with some of the things that I did share in this book from mm -hmm. my relationship with my mom to my journey through um, infertility with my husband to a there's just a lot of tenderness on these pages and to look back and see that I went through some really big things and mm -hmm. came out on the other side, more rooted in self trust that not only can I make it through things, but I can love myself through these things was a really a game changer for me. Um, that's not to say that I don't struggle sometimes with my past or that I don't struggle with certain regrets and choices that I've made. Mm -hmm. um, but the vulnerability speaks so much louder than the shame. Mm -hmm. And I think when we release ourselves from shame, we are able to be not only rooted in gratitude for what we went through, mm -hmm. but also open enough to say, yes, I went through that. And mm -hmm. here I am, you know, um, still standing. And my grandmother says that her prayers are the reason why I am here today, which likely is major. <laughs> Black grandmama prayers for mm -hmm. you too, and vulnerability and everything else, right? So mm -hmm. it's, um, it's yeah. really interesting just to know that we all struggle with vulnerability. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not easy, um, but it's absolutely necessary for us to cultivate authenticity with our relationship to self and to other people. Yeah, we were, it's so funny. We were talking about that before we came live, got on live that, mm -hmm. you know, people being in this space, people who may reach out to you and extend, you know, I can help you, I would love to help you. I wanna, you know, um, you know provide this service or whatever they feel like you may need that, that, that space for them to reach out. And here I am personally saying, no, no, I got it. I got it. <laughs> but, and, and not allowing myself to say, you know what, I, I will accept that assistance or that help or whatever that is. And as women and as black women, we walk around with our super capes on and all that. And so it's unlearning, you know, that and saying, you know what, I do need assistance or I do need help or I, I appreciate you reaching out for me versus mm -hmm. putting up the wall and saying, oh, I got it all together. Mm -hmm. That's ongoing, at least for me, it's an ongoing process. Yeah. Um, often to be vulnerable in that in that way. So I think we need to realize too that everything in life is a daily practice. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you listen to some of the you know experts of the world, the thought leaders, the religious leaders, the meditation teachers, everyone really says the same thing: is like what we cultivate in this life is a daily practice, mm -hmm. um, and. That goes for vulnerability, that goes to naming our needs, that goes from moving through our storms. Like it is not just this one and done sitch. It is, mm -hmm. it is a constant, it is a constant ebb and flow. Yeah, and being okay with that. That's the kicker too, being okay that it is a constant ebb and flow. Mm -hmm. yeah. yep. uh, next question says, what made you decide to write? I love writing and would love to write a book. Mm -hmm. uh, what what made you start doing that? I have been writing since I've been like seven. <laughs> Again, only child things, mm -hmm. you know, finding ways to be creative, writing stories. Yeah. And I had a karaoke machine and I would read the stories that I wrote and it'd be like, you know, little soap operas on tape, which is <laughs> so, I wish I still had those. That would be great. Mm -hmm. um, but it really wasn't until I started writing to heal, which was around age 18 or 19, I would actually say 19 or 20, um, where I was able to not just put my pain on the page, but to greet my pain and my grief and my depression um, and my anxiety with 
curiosity and I learned how to write to heal in therapy actually. Mm -hmm. Um, And it wasn't until then that I was really able to own my story, Mm -hmm. but also release the things that were no longer serving me and living a purpose filled and aligned life, Um, which can be, again, (laughs) none of this is easy. Mm -hmm. Um, And if if you want to write a book, I would say, write that book, start writing, putting pen to paper, getting curious about yourself, getting curious about what you like, what you don't like, fiction, nonfiction, et cetera, and just kind of lean into that. Um, I didn't expect to be an author. I'm I'm a journalism student dropout. Mm -hmm. Um, I did not expect to be in this work, but I find that it called me and Mm -hmm. things that call us are often aligned with our legacy and our life's work. So I answered that call and here I am today. Um, So yes, I have been writing for years and writing to heal um, really shifted like how I show up on the page and how I tell my stories. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's so powerful. Yeah. Heart to heal. Let's see. I have a couple more here. Uh, let's see. Um, someone asks, let's see here. She says, let me see here. Um, she says, hi, Alex. This is Melissa. I'm grateful to be here. I recently shared with you that I'd like to start telling my story through a website mm-hmm. where I can post some of my daily journal entries. What is your advice on how I can actually hit publish <laughs> and let go of the fear <laughs> that I'm feeling to start when I start when I want to share? How mm-hmm. do you first start sharing with other people? Mm. So Mm -hmm. I just told Melissa the other day to let me know when she hits publish and to send me the link so I can read it. Um, But what I would say is that nervousness, it's it's vulnerable. Mm -hmm. It's vulnerable to share your stories, especially your journal entries. And what really supported me in that is I had a friend tell me to stop hoarding my story and stop hoarding my happiness because I never know who needs who needs it. And I was just like, who wants to read my stories? You know, like I did not, and this was years and years ago, almost 10 years ago. And I did not think that I had a story worth telling. Um, But as I started writing to heal and learning how to heal myself, Mm -hmm. um, it made a lot of sense to show other people that they're not alone in their struggles. Mm -hmm. That is what writing and music does, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, you know, hip hop music or classical, it brings people together. It's this universal love language mm-hmm. that, you know, I'm a writer. I'm gonna encourage you, Melissa, to write the post and hit publish. I'm gonna nudge you and say, do that, but only do that when you're ready and you'll know when you're ready. Um, And you really never know who it's going to resonate with. Even if it's one person, that's one heart changed by your story. Mm -hmm. And that is magnificent. Absolutely. I love it. (laughs) I think people need to hear that. Not just her. I think probably several people need to hear that. Um, Where does, this is from Mayor, I believe it is. Pardon me if I mispronounced it. Um, it says, where does belonging come into the conversation? Like finding community, your people on this journey. I often find that the rain washes away others and mm. their loneliness. What lessons have you learned about moving through those moments and grieving those losses? And you do touch on that in your book too. <laughs> I do. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Was that in validation? That might've been in validation mm-hmm. that I touched on it, mm-hmm. um, that I wrote actually a lot about that. Mm-hmm. And I knew that I knew that I I knew that a lot of people would not be able to grow with me. Mm, Come on, Um, it's just the it's just the truth. Like it's and no one likes when I say that. They're like, "Girl," I'm like, "It's the truth." Yeah. Sometimes this pathway is the loneliest, and the belonging has to start with self. And I know that is not very fun to hear. Like I already belong to myself. Why do I need to be? you know, stuck in the cycle. And that's really what I was thinking Mm -hmm. when I first hit, I don't want to say rock bottom, but when I was really looking for my people, I knew I wanted to be partnered. I knew I wanted a group of women to um, be sister in sisterhood with. Mm -hmm. Um, And I also knew that I had some changing to do. Um, 
And because of that, I had to be by myself. And when I say be by myself, I was literally by myself for a year. Mm -hmm. I was not having sex. I was eating very, very clean. I got into my yoga practice. And these, of course, not saying that everyone has to do that, but from my pathway, Mm -hmm. that is what I did. I stopped entertaining men. I stopped everything. And there were people who were like, really not into me after that, you know, friends included, like, girl, you're no fun. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm just gonna have to be no fun because I can't keep going backwards. Right. And that's what I was doing because I wanted to have one foot into my belonging and the other foot into this new, like becoming a new version of myself. And I couldn't have both without the other being a distraction. Mm -hmm. Um, I also realized that not everybody can is equipped to hold space for our pain and hold space for our, for our joy, Mm -hmm. you know, that too, like, that's a thing too. And, um, I realized that the hard way, but it was awesome, an awesome lesson because then I had to start self validating and then I had to start thinking about, okay, well, where am I happiest? Where am I most upset? Like, how do I get out of my own way and get in front of not only my healing, but like the people I want to be around, the husband that I want to attract, the friends that I want to attract. How do I um, start this circle of belonging over again? Mm -hmm. And it was probably the loneliest year of my life, but it taught me so much about Alex and what I wanted and what I needed and what I deserved. Mm -hmm. I was selling myself short often. And um, I also was deciding that other people's joy came before mine, like it had to. In order for them to be happy, I had to shrink, you know? So it's like, no more of that. And when you release that, when you decide no more and you're stepping over the threshold into something new, into something maybe kind of foreign, um, it's, it's, it's frightening. (laughs) It's frightening and it's isolating and you will find your people and you will find if you're looking to be partnered, the right partner without having to settle and you will find yourself, you know, first and foremost, everything else is a compliment, Mm -hmm. right? I knew that when I met my husband, I did not want anyone to complete me. I was much of that. I did a lot of that in my younger years, like just Mm -hmm. wanting someone to complete me. No, I have to show up whole already. Right. So I knew that when I met my husband, I was going to be whole and hopefully he was going to be whole. And then we can come together and compliment each other. When I met my sister friends, then this is not to say people are without flaws because of course we're all flawed. Right. But when I met my sister friends, it was okay. I'm coming to the table with abundance and she's coming to the table with abundance and there's no shrinking and there's no scarcity mindset and there's no lack. So that's just my personal pathway. I feel you on the belonging piece. Mm -hmm. We need belonging. We're human beings. It is something that we absolutely thrive off and need, but, and rather not, but, and we have to learn the power of belonging to self before investing in that outside energy. Mm-hmm. Well, that is a word. And I think some people are typing, you said the word. Um, and I, you know, there's so many women, I have women in my family and I'm thinking of you and your journey, you know, attracting your husband and attracting your sister friends. But, you know, at some point, uh, at least I've heard from some of my friends, I'm tired of hearing, you know, I'm single, I'm still single. And you keep telling me I need to find myself or I need, you know, I keep hearing all this stuff about, you know, being on this journey and, and being vulnerable and taking that time for myself. At some point, you know, I don't. I personally don't know what to say anymore because, what do you say? I'll ask that when people feel like feel that. You know, it is. These are amazing women who, have, on their amazing journeys, and and you know, all around. And you say you, you talk about that community and having a spouse or having kids. Mm-hmm. What do you tell them when that 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 space still isn't filled by someone, even if they're mm-hmm. on that of self validation? Does that make sense? Does it that- does make it does make sense. And I, you know, it's really hard for me to. Mm-hmm even speak on that because because every woman is so different. And I think it's really important to note too that not every woman wants to be partnered and not every woman wants to have children, you know, and that is absolutely well within her rights mm-hmm. and needs to be honored as well. And of course, 
we and still we still want to belong we still want you know our our community um mm. i don't have an answer for that one i think it's really hard i mean i look at some folks in my personal circle who are struggling with that same thing mm -hmm. um but they're also i think trying to find new ways to fill those voids that doesn't require someone else mm -hmm. and i think that that's really what i what that's i know that's what i had to do i right. was always looking for someone else to kind of step in even when i was really feeling my wholeest self yeah. um i was always kind of like well that you know i wasn't looking at people's presence in my life as this beautiful extra thing it was more so like putting them into this puzzle of my life when mm -hmm. instead we should be the finished puzzle already right instead of having people come put their pieces down that that might not fit mm -hmm. um so because every woman's journey and, and man's journey is different mm -hmm. i don't think i can answer that question straightforward but i can say um belonging is absolutely necessary if you're great you are great regardless if you have someone standing next to you or not you're still great and i just think that that's really important for people to know it doesn't make you less than Right. for not being partnered and not being a mother. And it doesn't make you less than for not wanting those things either. You know, we still have to make space for community mm -hmm. and only we can, only we know how to do that. I wish there was like a, a manual I could like I hand people, but you know, it's not. It's not, no, it's not. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, our last question here, and then I have one more too. It says, hi, Alex, I'm currently trying to write my first book while working full time. How do you make time for juggling your writing and life? Um, it says, I'm also finding that it's lonely to, a lonely process. Um, yeah. So what 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 are your advice for that? Your thoughts? So, um, Hama. oh my goodness. I don't, <sighs> it was really, when I was working full time, I haven't had a full, I haven't been, I have been self-employed for eight years. My last job I talked about in the very first chapter yeah. of this book, <laughs> called change mm -hmm. was um year it was years ago now and i remember feeling that same way and i actually had my first baby book out it was a collection of poems and affirmations called words from a wanderer and i self-published it and that really is how i kicked off like my author career was by self-publishing and i'm so glad i did that because it got me you know excuse me here i always recommend self-publishing first because nowadays with numbers and everything like that publishers want to see that you have an audience yeah and all of that so cheers to self-publishing if you're thinking about going that route um but i remember feeling like there wasn't enough time in a day so i had a full-time job but i was also writing i was also making jewelry to like have extra pocket money mm -hmm. um i had a kid at home, you know, and I just knew that I was never going to be able to do this. I'm like, this is just unrealistic. And I didn't have many people other than my husband and a couple of friends saying to go for it. Mm -hmm. Like my parents thought I was insane. My family thought I was playing around and we have a pretty small family. So like, it's interesting to hear people's negativity in a small group because mm -hmm. it's even more amplified, you know? Um, and not negativity in a way to, maybe not negativity, critical mm -hmm. language about like, hmm, you're gonna write books you're gonna do what you're not gonna have health insurance i have health insurance self-employed people have health insurance you know like i you're gonna you're gonna not get a steady paycheck it's all these very scary things but one thing i had to keep in mind was that the end goal was to be um i don't want to say be my own boss it was so much more than that the end goal was to live in alignment and in divine good with my purpose and going to work for somebody else was not it for me, but I knew that I had to do that. Sure. So I was balancing, I was penciling myself in, I was making time to write, I was writing on weekends, I was um, talking through it with my friends who were also writers and just being in conversation around people who were supportive of that. Yeah. Um, and I chose not to quit and I chose, again, to loop back to what we were talking about earlier, to choose myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, life is the longest, shortest time that we have. And I don't want to look up and be 70 
and thinking like, damn, I should have done that thing when I was 23, you know, or damn, I should have done that thing when I was 30. Um, and I think that comes from, you know, just witnessing some of the women in my family hold a lot of regret on their shoulders because they had to do, you know, they had to hold it down. Mm -hmm. And then they also had like no time to lift themselves up. Mm -hmm. And that, that's something that I have shattered as far as the generational trauma and curses that I'm breaking mm -hmm. and showing my children. Um, and also just taking a bet on myself. Like right. you're good at what you do and do it mm -hmm. even if no one understands yeah yeah again isolating again belonging again like we wish that people could just get on board you know right, right but the lesson is not people getting on board the lesson is where you're driving the lesson is where you're going and staying strong in your um choices to create the life that you want to create come on alex Come on, Alex. Good. <laughs> yeah. It's in you driving. Yeah, that resonated with me. Um, so what do you want your legacy to be? What do you want it to be, Miss Alex L? Mm. Have you ever thought about it? I think about legacy a lot. And I know that my books will outlive me. And that's really beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, and I just want my legacy to leave behind... If I had to pick three words, it would be um, faith, it would be self-love, mm -hmm. and it would be curiosity. Mm. I want everybody who reads my work to walk away having faith that something bigger is on the horizon, that they can love themselves even when other people choose not to, mm -hmm. and um, that it really all just circles back to us and what we are curious about. Curiosity is brilliant. It keeps us young. It keeps us nurturing our inner child. It keeps us creative. Mm -hmm. And as Black people in particular, I think we deserve that curiosity and that joy and that exploration of creativity mm -hmm. um, in really big ways. And I just hope that my work gives people the permission to explore their own. Mm, I love it. Well, I appreciate you. I have other questions. I want to know what you do. You listen to what hip hop are you listening to? <laughs> what do you do for Thanksgiving? Do you celebrate Thanksgiving? <laughs> oh my goodness! So what I'm listening to right now, I will share this. Everybody, go stream this after we get off. Um, the Handle with Care album by Natalie Lauren Sims. Thank me later. I need y'all to send me a personal email, selfcare at alexl.com and say thank you after you listen to this album because it will bless your life. That's how good it is. It's always on rotation. Um, and Thanksgiving, you know, we're here, the five of us. We're probably just gonna, we are just gonna be home um, and probably just gonna order pizza. And my grandmother is not happy about it, but it has to be this way. <laughs> what are we talking? But pizza, I know that's not up our alley too. Oh <laughs> oh what was the name of the al album again? Was it Handle with Care? Is that what it was? Handle with Care um, by Natalie Lauren Sims. Natalie Lauren Sims? Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Awesome. She's amazing. It's going to bless you. Well, I am appreciative of you blessing us tonight with your time and your energy. I know the little girls are probably looking for mommy, perhaps. Um, but we just appreciate you for coming to Mahogany Books Front Row. And I can't oh, thank you in our store since you're not too far away. I not too far at all. I cannot wait to come in and be in person. That would just be awesome. Yeah, we appreciate it. We'll have a great holiday. Have a great week. We okay. appreciate you. Take care. Okay, take care. Good night, everybody. Hi, Bye. Thank you everybody for coming on. <laughs> Someone's asking again, Natalie Lauren Sims. <laughs> yes, yes. Awesome. Have a great night, everybody. <laughs> okay.